Always pause for a second there to make sure everything is running. Hello, everybody. My name is John Mayer, and I'm the executive director of Cali. Here's that disembodied voice that you're seeing. Um, as you can see, it's a new week, and, uh, and I got my hair cut. Uh, welcome to Topics in Digital Law Practice. This is week five, free legal research tools. I wanted to remind everybody that there is uh, no CLE credit offered for this course. Um, I understand that there are some states that allow you to self-report. Um, that's great, but that's your responsibility. Uh, we haven't uh, arranged for any CLE credit for this course. The goals of this course, to just to remind everybody, we want to give students uh, access to the most up-to-date information about 21st century law practice. We want to inform law faculty, yes, we do have some law faculty attending, and that's wonderful, about the changing nature of law practice so that it can inform their teaching. We also want to create enduring resource that we can build on for future audiences. Um, we're pretty happy with the way this class is going or, or this course is going, and we're learning a lot. And uh, we expect to uh, offer uh, the same course or similar course, uh, maybe with uh, different speakers um, on an ongoing basis in the future. Um, and the solution we have is, is that this is a massive online open course. Everything's done in the open. There's a lot of people attending. We have over 800 people who have registered. Not all of you uh, show up live every week, but uh, quite a few are uh, viewing the videos, the screencasts, uh, post fact. Oh, I wanted to remind you that uh, we're at that halfway point. And so if, if, you're, uh, if you're having a good time, if this is working out, if there's anything positive and praise you can say about us, please do tell your friends, tell your colleagues, uh, tweet about it at TDLP. Um, if you're on Twitter and you wanna know when we're doing things with this, you should follow Cali.org. Um, or myself, John P. Mayer, as uh, we both provide uh, updates and information or tell other people to follow us for the latest information about this class. The top two are the URLs for this class. As you know, classcaster.net is the blog where we post the videos and slides um, and the homeworks. Uh, wikispaces.com, the TDLP wikispaces.com is where you do your homeworks. And you get badges every time you complete a homework. The reveal for the new badge for week five, drum roll please, is that badge. So when you complete this week's homework, which, which I, I think is pretty, pretty easy, um, you'll be getting that badge. Let me back up because I wanted to also show you something about that. So we've reformatted the page, the, the home page of the wiki, and now your badges are in a, uh, in, in a sort of a band in which um, there's uh, empty spaces for the, for, the, for the ones that you haven't done. And I, I fill in, uh, I check this almost every single day to see uh, your progress. Um, I do try to read everybody's homeworks, although I don't read them with, uh, with the intent of giving you any feedback. There's too many of you. I apologize for that. Um, but, uh, but, I, but I am impressed by the quality of the materials I've seen, um, and, and I thank you for that. Um, there was a assignment last week where we asked you to um, gather articles. This was the extra credit assignment, and post them by state. And I see that some of you have started to do that. That's fantastic. Keep going. This, is, this, is, this will become or can become a, a wonderful resource for other people who are seeking information on unbundled legal services or limited scope agreements. Back to the PowerPoint. As a reminder, if you have any questions, there's a question box. We gather the questions to ask the speaker afterwards. And then those that we don't get to, we post to the website. Um, and we get the, as much as possible, we get the speaker to answer them. Um, we got to chase down Richard Granite for the questions that we posted last week. Um, he's, been, he's an awfully busy guy, and so I'm not surprised that he hasn't had a chance to update those, um, but I'll be, uh, I'll be bugging him uh, soon about that. So this week, it's week five, where we're over the hump now and halfway. Our speaker is Sarah Glassmeyer. Sarah Glassmeyer is um, a, the Director of Content Development at um, some obscure organization known as uh, Cali. Oh yes, 
Cali, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. She's a uh, former reference librarian from uh, Valparaiso uh, University School of Law and the University of Kentucky College of Law. She has taught legal research and has been a reference librarian and so knows a lot about this topic because she's quite savvy on the uh, on the internet. And we're delighted to have her speaking to us today. So I'm going to hand things off to uh, Austin to say, bring up Sarah and let's get started. Okay. Hi, everyone. Wait. Uh, you can see my screen, I hope. Yes, indeed. Um, okay, awesome. Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, just continuing with the tradition. This is, so the disembodied voice you don't see. Um, this is what I look like. I, I'm, a, I'm a former librarian. I still look like a librarian, but now I work at Cali. Um, this is me in my office last week, um, but it's still basically what I look like. Okay. So, you've been kind of brought today under slightly um, false terms. The topic has been told, uh, described as free legal research. Um, and actually, there's no such thing as free research. And there's really no such thing as free legal research. Um, but there are lots of free tools you can use within that process because research is a process and that's what we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today actually. Um, it's no hard thing to provide lists of free, you know, sources of case law and free sources of foreign law and I'll do that at the end of the talk but, you know, otherwise it would just be me reading lists so that's not very exciting. Um, and the other thing, don't think that you're going to come out of today knowing exactly how to do research and just be completely savvy. Research is a, it's a skill. It takes a long time. And I, you know, it's not that long ago that I was a reference librarian and, you know, people would come up and ask me a question and I would find an answer very quickly and they would be, oh, wow, you know, it's because I've been doing this for 15 years. I, you know, it, it's something that you have to keep working at and have to keep practicing that. You do, you will get better at it. So what are we going to talk about today, actually? Um, we're going to spend a lot of time, like I said, on learning how to do research and thinking about what research is and then specifically how to do that for free. Um, and then we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about Google and um, Google Scholar, how to use those the most efficient way. And then wrapping up at the end, um, talking about the legal web. And I'm gonna, then at the end, there's just a whole bunch of links to slides that will also be provided um, in a Word uh, Google Doc that we'll share with the class that has, you know, kind of vetted links of places that are good to go for you to do research. So, we're going to start out with the research process and especially I know a lot of your law, law students, um, it, I have many issues with <laughs> American law schools today and how we teach legal research and one of a big one is the fact that it's done your first year law school when you're so thrown into the deep end and legal research is kind of given, you know, like two hours, maybe depending on where you go, you'll get six hour lectures with a librarian but you don't really ever see the full process. You are, you just see you one week you're doing cases and one week you're doing ALRs. You don't see how they all fit in together. So this is a flow chart I made for my students and then, you know, feel free to use it. This is also will be provided to you. You know, I CC license it. So if you're a professor or librarian, feel free to use it and adapt it. Um, but here's the process. You start off by thinking, what is the question I'm going to answer? And in the real world, it's not obvious. When you're in class, you know, your professors work really hard to give you a hypothetical that will point you at the right resource to use so they makes it easy to grade for us. Um, actually, that's why we do it that way. <laughs> um, but the real world, it's not like that. You know, I lived in Kentucky for several years, <laughs> you know, working a reference desk and people come in with these huge problems and it's, you know, you hear, you know, it's like ex-wife gets involved in jail and, and you realize at the end of the day, the problem is they, are getting evicted because they didn't pay their rent because they were in jail for dealing pot. But the really thing you want to worry about is the eviction. That's our problem. So a lot of what you're going to do as an attorney and in practice is to weed out um, all the extraneous facts and figure out what is the issue that I really need to solve in this um, particular transaction. And then before you start doing searches, you need to go and create a list of keywords and concepts. And probably your professors told you this, but it really is important. It doesn't seem like it would be, but it really does help to kind of brainstorm before you dive in because, um, you know, we're talking about free legal research today, but in the, you know, 
<laughs> when you're not using a free resource, it will cost you a lot of money if you're running searches that aren't efficient for you to run. So you should be doing that no matter what. And then we go to, we're now at, are you familiar with the answer with this area of the law? If you're a law student, the answer is no. I don't care if you've taken a class on it. I don't care if you wrote a seminar paper on this topic. I don't care if you worked for some attorney in this area of law for one summer. Bless your hearts, but you have no idea what you're talking about. You know just enough to be dangerous. And so you need to start with secondary resources. Um, so these are treatises, law review articles, dictionaries, encyclopedias, something that will give you a handle on um, you know, what, the area, what the real issues are in this particular area of law. And it will point you at you know, primary resources often that are um, the answer to your question. And even if you are familiar with the area of law, it never hurts to look at secondary resources because when you're an attorney and you're doing research, time is money. So it doesn't matter if you're using Lexis, Westlaw, the internet for your research, no matter what you're using, you're still also using your time. And you will have to bill out for your time and be responsible for that. So whatever is the most efficient for you to use, you need to do that. Um, okay, so using your secondary sources, you might find your answer. Um, but if not, you might have to do some primary law searching. And you kind of know you have the right answer when you start seeing the same um, answers over and over again. So then you have that, and then you need to make sure that you have, that your law is still good law. And so this is a citator or shepherdizing or key site, authority verification. It all goes by different terms, usually shepherdizing, even though um, people just call it that, like how people call tissues Kleenexes. Um, you have to make sure your law is still good, and then you determine what format it has to be in. So, you know, if you're new to law, you know, law practice, check and you're in a firm, ask for the boilerplate files, because a lot of times they have this stuff already drafted. You just fill in the blanks, you're good to go. Um, there might be a form, and one thing you'll learn, some forms are actually prescribed by the legislature, so you don't have to, you know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time. But you just think about what your, um, your ultimate product has to be. And then you're almost to the end. You put your citations in correct format, or blue booking, or all witting. And I know when you're in law school, this seems like it's just this complex hazing ritual, and it kind of is in some respects. But it really is important to cite your resources correctly, so that way someone, look, you know, if it's a paper or more of an academic resource, they can find what sources you cited and then verify that what you've said is true. And then you're done. That wasn't that hard, now was it? Yay, you're done. Okay. So now let's put this in the context of free legal research. And, <laughs> you know, I'm German, so I don't like anyone to be happy, so let's talk about the things that you can't do using legal research, using free resources. The searching secondary resources and using citators and putting in citations, even the correct format, are somewhat difficult to do using only free resource, resources. Um, you know, secondary sources, treatises, those are all things you might have to go to the library to use if you want to, um, or you, you'll have to just pay Westlaw or Lexis to get at, that, at, at those resources. Citators. Um, there are some free citators, and I'll talk about those in a little bit, and they're getting better all the time, but really, again, going back to the idea that your time is money, it might be quicker and more efficient to use Lexis, Westlaw, that sort of thing. And even one thing you wouldn't think that you would need to pay for, the, the blue booking part, um, you know, if a lot of these free resources that I'm going to talk about, they use the citations of the state, you know, the public domain state resources. and for only about, I think it's 18 jurisdictions, it's either 11, 14, or 18, I always get these numbers confused. Um, but you'll have to go back and cite it to like the Northwest Reporter, the Northeast Reporter, which is something that's owned by West, so you'll either have to go to a library that's subscribed to those reporters so you can get your you know, exact page numbers down, or you'll have to you know, look them up on Westall so you can get your exact page numbers because, believe it or not, that's something that is controlled. So, now that I've torn you down, let's build you back up. What can you do for free? Thinking. Thinking is relatively free. So you can do a lot of your pre-work before you start paying for stuff. And the more pre-work you do, it'll, even if you're, you depend, no matter what you're using, it'll be more um, cost, more of a cost savings to you. And then the rest is kind of a hodgepodge of um, whether or not it's free or the quality of it. So searching primary law, it really depends on what jurisdiction you are, what kind of primary law you're after. 
Um, you can see the, the citators and the um, putting citations in the correct format. And even the secondary sources, I, I also yellow box them because it is kind of, it's getting better all the time. Um, especially like law reviews, a lot more of those are being put up on the free web in addition to being locked behind a database. Um, and hopefully that will just continue to get better. It probably won't ever be a, a full green, but it's not as bad as it was. Okay, so let's talk about free research. And that means the internet to everyone. And everyone's like, yay, they love the internet. But let's talk about what the internet is. The internet um, and the World Wide Web are not the same thing. I use them interchangeably, most people do, that's fine. But I just kinda wanna let you know they aren't actually the same thing. The internet is the connections between the computers and you know various um, databases, that sort of thing. And the web is the overlay to it. So that's just one of those, make yourself look smart in front of your IT department. <laughs> Be aware that the World Wide Web and the internet aren't the same things. Westlaw, Westlaw Lexis, other databases, they're not the internet. A lot of times people say, I'm in front of the computer, I'm on the internet, no you're not. They think you have to enter a password into usually, not the internet. Those are electronic resources, different. Um, not everything on the internet is free. You, a lot of times, kind of get a gateway into it, especially if you're doing um, like people searching or that sort of thing that you, they'll index it and you can see what's available, but then if you actually want to get at that information, you have to pay for it. And then not everything's on here. Um, you know, maybe one day the internet will be complete, but there's still a lot of materials that's locked either behind a paywall or just still in books that you have to, you'll, sorry, you'll have to use a book. I know that's horrible to a lot of people. And it's a lot of junk, but we'll, we're going to learn how to filter out the junk. But despite that, it's still a very useful research tool. Okay, so the next few slides are, um, may seem like, why are we talking about this? It's kind of technical information. Um, there's a quote I like by Arthur C. Clarke um, that says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I chalk up a lot of stuff that happens with computers to magic. And that's okay if you want to do that too, really. I mean, you don't have to know exactly how everything works. Um, I always kind of use a comparison to driving a car. Like, you don't know how to know how an com internal combustion engine works. You don't have to know really too much how to do <laughs> anything but drive it. But if you see a pool of liquid under your car, it's good to know this is you know just drippage from like air conditioner or is this oil or is it brake fluid? So this is kind of just like that level of knowledge about how the internet works. All right, there are three parts of the internet. The surface internet, the deep web or the invisible web and the dead web. And we're gonna cover all those. The surface internet is what you're used to seeing. Um, and why are you used to seeing it? It's because it's findable by search engines. So here is how search engines work, um, mostly by magic. They call it algorithms, but I prefer to call it magic. They, they look at through you know, these complex processes that we don't need to understand exactly what they are, you know, the content of web pages, who links to these web pages, all that sort of stuff. And what they do is how they get that information is they send spiders out. So spiders are a type of computer program and they crawl along the series of tubes that are the internet and they get the web pages and they look and they see what's all on the web page and they index it that way. But spiders don't always work um, because there's something called robots. And robots are a way that um, web designers can block the spiders. Now, admittedly, this starts to sound a little bit like a 1950s horror movie, but this is just how the internet works. Magic spiders and robots. That's the basics of it. I mean, <laughs> so if you've never looked at the guts of a web page, this is what it looks like. Um, this is what the White House's website, whitehouse.gov, looks like. And this is all the stuff that your web browser looks like, looks at to determine what um, the website should appear when you surf to it on the web. Now, not all of it is, though. It's like this line of data right here has absolutely nothing to do with the appearance of the website. This is all for um, the search engine's benefit. And I don't know, you know depending on what you're viewing this on, um, you might not be able to tell, but come back and look at this slide. You can see kind of at the end of it, it has all the various misspellings of Barack Obama's name, because they want this. This is what the spiders are going to look at. Um, so if someone's looking for Bark, B-A-R-C-K, <laughs> this web page, and they think they're looking for Brock, this is what this web page will hopefully come up. So why did I just explain that to you? Why did you care? 
is because designers game the system. So there's something, if you ever look at, you know, kind of programs for web designers or even just, you know, if you're an attorney and it's talking about how to have a web page, there's something called SEO and that is search engine optimization. Um, basically, when you go to the go to the Google, sorry, I just turned into 80 years old for a second there. When you go to Google and you do a search, it's not an accident, the first hit, not at all. Someone has worked very, very hard. So if you're in Rockford, Illinois, and you search for a divorce attorney, what that first hit is going to be. Um, so it's good business. And then it's also, you have to understand, you know, people kind of do it either for political reasons or just jokes. This is something that's come up very recently with um, Rick Santorum's presidential candidacy. You might have, if you've decided to look in to see what his, he was about and you Google the word Santorum, it's not all of his presidential platforms. Um, for a while there during the, first, the beginning of the um, Iraq war, if you search for weapons of mass destruction, a 404 page not found um, came up. Uh, George Bush was linked to the words miserable failure. It's just kind of one of those things that people do either for fun or for political reasons. Um, but overall, just the idea is that you might miss important content because the, the example, you know, what Google puts up is not, you know, magic only goes for it so far. It's people have determined that what's going to be the first hit. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's a surface web. And that's what you spend probably all your time on. But it's really such a small part of what's available on the web. Um, there's the deep web. It's also um, called the invisible web. And it's really about 90% of what's available there. And there's various reasons why it's hidden. Um, it could be the format of the page. And that's changing a lot, too. I mean, it used to be if something was a PDF, it never showed up at Google. But they're getting better at finding that information. The robots, um, stuff that's behind a password, dynamic content, so anything as a result of a search word. That's just not going to come up always in a Google search, but it doesn't mean you can't find it. You just have to use an index and indexes are basically the human version of Google. And I've listed three here. Um, the Internet Public Library is much more general. It covers all sorts of topics. Oyster and Complete Planet seem to cover more academic subjects. Um, so they're just ways and there's lots of other indexes out there. It's just a human has to go through, find the web page, determine if it's about this subject, and then they put it in a physical index for you to find. <coughs> and then finally, there's the dead web. Um, people redesign websites all the time, and URLs just move or they're removed because, you know, it's not always for nefarious purposes. People just take stuff offline because they think no one needs it anymore, but it turns out people really like that web page. And it's important because it's for you to know this because uh, court decisions, law review articles, they're citing web pages more and more. Um, this is a, a study was done, I want to say it was like 2006 or 2007. It was a law library journal article. Um, the author was Helene Davis. I know this because she's my former boss, <laughs> not because, I mean, it's a good article, but it's not anything so great that I've remembered that. But so you can look it up that way, um, Helene Davis. But it is, she did a study of law journal articles that cited websites over a three-year period. And during that three-year period, 40% of the links became broken, so no longer available. But just like um, with you know, the invisible web, that doesn't mean they're no longer available. You just have to work a little harder to find them. So here are three sources for them. One is the Cyber Cemetery, and that's operated out of um, the University of North Texas, and that's for government websites. The government is kind of notorious for taking down websites, <laughs> um, especially in pulling back information that and, you know, it's just for national security reasons or whatever. They just will completely wipe everything and then, but this the cyber cemetery keeps it. Um, and the other one is Google Cache. That's at the bottom of the list. <clears throat> and that is only good for the last time that Google's uh, spiders trolled that particular website. So it could be a day old or it could be several months old. You never really know. And then the third option is the Wayback Machine. And this is really cool. So I'm actually going to take the time and show you a screenshot. This is operated by the uh, Internet Archive, and what it does right there, a lot of people I have taught this several times, no one can find the search box, it's right there in the center by the red arrow. Um, all you do is put the URL of the website, you know, where you're getting that 404 web page not found message, hit take me back, and you'll get, you'll get um, options to view the web page as it appeared on several different days. It, it really depends on what the website is and how often they uh, 
the spiders have gone through. So this is the Cali Org's website. Um, this is as it appeared on January 25th, 2002, so a little over 10 years ago. And you can kind of see along the top, there's been 141 captures of Cali's website um, that you can kind of see through the years. Um, so it's very, this is just a really useful tool when stuff gets taken down off the web. Try this. Um, there's no guarantees. It just kind of really depends when their spiders go through. And again, if the robots are blocking it, you know, for whatever reason, the web designer put robots in that you can't find it, you're kind of out of luck. But um, this is just a really good resource to use. Okay. So now that we understand what the web is, let's talk about doing research on the web. Um, just another quote, doing research on the web is like a library assembled piecemeal by pack rats and vandalized nightly. It's actually not that bad. Um, but you do have to do a little bit of work on your own. You know, when, you're, when you buy access to a database or you buy a book, there's uh, editorial staff there that have gone through and have kind of vetted everything that you're reading. And this, in exchange for that, you know, in exchange for it, for free, you have to do that vetting. So it's kind of like DIY home repair. Um, you've probably heard this before, but just to, you know, reiterate, these are some of the things you should be looking at. You know, the authority, the currentness, who, who wrote it, see if you can determine that. And this even applies to like Wikipedia pages. Wikipedia is a great resource. It's been shown to be as accurate as, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica. But it's, it never hurts, especially like on a hot topic. Like right now, if I were looking up Rush uh, Limbaugh's Wikipedia page, I'm sure it's been edited heavily <laughs> in the past few weeks. Um, so, you know, like a Wikipedia, you can always view the history tab, see how something's been edited. Um, sometimes you have to just kind of look around, see who actually um, is the author of the web page. And, and there are a lot of hoaxes out there, and it's not necessarily people being nefarious. It's just, you know, it's kind of a parody site. It's just one of those things to be aware of. You do have to do a little investigation. Okay, so we talked about the web, we talked about doing research on the web, and the way you're going to do research on the web most likely is via Google. Um, this is a very librarian-y slide. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about how to limit your search term. Google's great. Google has the web indexed, you know, very well. It's really, they have that one search box that everyone, you know, it's very easy to use. You just throw in the terms you're looking for and you get back millions of hits. And this is one of those things I think like librarians understand, but I don't know that the rest of the world is. When you're doing research, your goal is not to find as much as you can or, or even to find just that one perfect case. The goal when doing research is not to find things, it's to edit crap out. So you only have to read 10 cases instead of 100, or only, you know, you're, you're searching in the, in the OPAC of your library's catalog. You don't, want, you don't want a thousand books you have to sort through. You want a hundred that are, you know, entries to read through. So this is how you do it. They're all basically limits, even though, you know, one is terms of con labeled here limits in terms of connectors. So these are just some tricks you can use when you are Googling. The first is similar terms. Um, and then red is going to pop up all of the um, examples of how you would use this. So if you do Tidal Day, that's over the dash key, kind of like on the far left-hand side on the American keyboard. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you do Tidal Day Dog, this will also bring up like breed information because Google and all computers, they, they're only as smart as what you tell them, really. So if you misspell words, and Google is better about I actually use Google as a um, spell check a lot of times because you, know, you type in something like, well, did you really mean this? And like, oh, yeah, actually I did. <laughs> Thank you very much. But if you're using other databases, they, they will only look for what you type in. They won't realize that you have a typo. Um, so if, if you do Cheetle Day Dog, you'll get Beagle, you'll get Golden Retrieval, you'll get Dog, you'll get anything kind of similar to Dog. Um, limits, domain, and this is especially useful if you're doing legal research. So if you only want government websites, you put site colon gov. And so only websites that end in .gov will be searched. Um, Google used to have something called Google Uncle Sam. I think they've actually taken that offline. But this, this is all Google Uncle Sam was. It just was searching .gov sites. Um, you can also use this if a website doesn't have its own search box. So we do here at Cali. But if you wanted to just search the Cali website, you could do site cali.org and then your search terms. And then it would only search the cali.org website. You can also limit by file type. Um, so if you only want pictures, if you only want spreadsheets, I mean, there's, if you kind of look around um, 
I'll, I'll, I don't have it on my materials now, but I'll do this. There's a, a way, a listing of all the different file types you can limit by. Um, if you only want Word docs, you only want PDFs, you can do that. Proximity, this is awesome. You should be doing this <laughs> um, even if you're using Google, if you're using Lexis, using Westlaw, this is really awesome. And I can give you a real, real world example of this. I was using it just this week. Okay, so John Mayer, the guy who speaks at the beginning of these things, my boss, if you're not following him on Twitter, you should, but he tweets these things called Mayer's Laws that he's um, <laughs> coming up with on the fly. And I'm a librarian and it drives me crazy that he does not maintain a list of these. And so I was trying to just like look them all up and just keep a running list of them because I, I'm just anal that way. But sometimes he tweets them as like Mayer's 13th law and sometimes he tweets them as Mayer's law number 13. And so if I put Mayer's law in quotes, I miss some of them. So what I did was tweet Mayer around to law. So that would get Mayer's law right next to get each other and Mayer like number 12 law so it'll pick up both of those. So this is a really powerful way to, if, if you're the, you know, something that doesn't always use an exact phrase, that's a way, but the words are always close together. That's a really good one to use. Um, and you don't use in Google. It, it just automatically assumes it's there. Or you do have to use. Exclude, most databases use not. In Google, you use a hyphen. And something you have to be careful, it'll autocorrect to the dash. The hyphen's a small one. And so, but, you know, limiters and this exclusion is a really good one. Um, so it would be cats, but nothing that, if dogs are mentioned in that web page, that would not come up. And parentheses, this is how you group uh, all these different things together. Now, this is, this is awesome. This is like makes librarians really, really excited. You feel like a total research badass when you can like create a search string like this. But if you, just to translate it, this is um, dogs and words related to dogs. So you'll get dogs, you'll get golden retrievers, you'll get <laughs> um, hound dogs, anything, but not beagles won't be mentioned. Within three words of cats and words related to cats, but not tabby cats. I mean, that is, when you get good at this and you create a really powerful search string like this, it makes your life so much easier and so much less stuff you have to sort through. But again, it's not something that automatically happens. It takes time to do. You have to stop and think a little bit. But when you do do it, it's really great. I mean, I got so excited when I, you know, it's like, this is, this is good stuff for a librarian. I just, just trust me on that. Okay, and this is just a slide because the terms of connectors thing gets kind of diff, you know, hard to remember because or and and are actually the opposite of what they, you think they would be. So I just put this slide in here um, just to remind you guys of what that all means. Okay, so Google Advanced Search. If you don't want to be a research badass, you don't have to. <laughs> it's fun, but I understand that most people are normal and just want to do their search and get on with life. So Google Advanced actually takes care of this for you. You don't have to remember the, last, the stuff I had in the last slide. So... You can, like have in the middle there, you can, see you can limit by file type, you can limit by domain, um, the exact wording or phrase or one or more of these words. So this, it does cut down on having to remember a lot of these things. But if you're doing research on the web, specifically for something academic or legal, use the advanced search. It'll make life a lot easier. So now you, you know how to Google a little bit more efficiently. And there's a reason why I told you about this is because with Google Scholar, um, and this is another thing they kind of hide. They used to be very obvious about where Google Scholar was in Google Advanced Search, um, but they're really hard to find, but they are still there now. So, but Google Scholar, it looks at academic publishers, um, material that universities put up on the web, online repositories, and this is something that's becoming really big. Um, certain universities have rules that now when their faculty publish, they have to put their published material up on the, the free web in addition to whatever journal they publish in or whatever, you know. So Google Scholar scrapes that and there's a way then you can access it. But starting in November, November 2009, they started putting court opinions up. And that, you know, obviously, ding, 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 hey, <laughs> for lawyers and law students, that's great. Um, so let's look at this a little bit. 
So Google Advanced Scholar Search, it, it looks very similar to regular Google Advanced Search. Um, in the green bar, I have the exact phrase, unauthorized practice, and at least one of the words, law. So this will be searching unauthorized practice, and then law will be in there somewhere, but not. I didn't do a, a round with this one. And a Google Scholar search results look very similar to what um, regular Google looks like, um, as you can see. There is a cited by. So what this is are articles that have cited your article. So you can, you know, that's just more things to look at. And then there, the, if full text is available, that it'll immediately pull it up here. So um, it kind of depends, you know, it might just be something that um, has been put on a faculty member's website or an institutional repository, something that the university have created. You never really know. And depending on where you are, another option might be to find in a library that'll then immediately jump and run a library search for you. Um, but like this Fordham one, you can see it's also held by Hein Online. I'm here in a university or a law school building. And so Google through magic knows that and they <laughs> let me know it's also available via Hein Online. So as far as the case law goes, um, on the right-hand side, I have the listing. So it's not a complete collection of case law, but it's pretty good. So you know, depending on what area of law you're doing research, what your needs are, you could probably get by pretty far with just using this free Google case law. And to do the search for case law, you still want to be on the advanced scholar search page. But then right at the bottom there is where you search your legal opinions and journals. And here's just a blow up of what that looks that little box looks like. Um, but you want to, you know, it's search legal opinions and journals. Don't really click that one if you're just want case law, because that will give you case law, but it'll also give you law journal articles. And that might be too much stuff to uh, sort, sort through. And because remember, we don't want, <laughs> we're trying to limit the amount of crap to look through. But you can do federal courts, specific circuits, or a specific state court. And this is what a case law looks like on Google Scholar. It's, it works really good on mobile devices. So if you're doing searching like that, um, just kind of one issue, the, the citations are up there. It'll have the official Northeastern Reporter citation. Um, and they'll have the parallel citation of, um, to a state reporter. Now, if it's only printed in a West product like Northwest Reporter, I'm pretty sure those won't appear. I have to double check on that, but I'm 99% sure they, those don't appear. But um, the Illinois one that's published by the state, the public domain case law. And then, you know, much like in Lexis and Westlaw, the pages numbers are put in there through asterisks, but it will only be the page numbers for the Illinois reporter in this case. So if you have to, you know, cite using the Northwest reporter or the Northeast reporter, you're going to have to go to a library and pull the volume and get the exact page numbers or um, you know, look it up via Lexis or Westlaw. But still you could do a lot of research here and get pretty far as just the citation you'll have to come back and check on. Um, and it is, but it's otherwise, you know, as user friendly as any other electronic case um, resource. You know, if there's a case cited, it'll be hyperlinked to that. Well, if it's cited that it's within the Google database, it'll be hyperlinked, so you can jump right to it. Um, as far as authority verification, down here, that's the case in the Brotherhood of RR Trainmen. The cited by 116 house cited related articles, that's their, their version of shepherdizing or key citing or authority verification. Um, and this is what it looks like. So this is, um, and there's been an update literally just last night up to this that the next slide will show you. But kind of to my mind, you know, depending on how many times it's been cited and what your time pressures are, it might be worth it to check in key site or shepherds and see if there's been like the red arrow or the red stop sign or the yellow to see which ones you should really read because this will just show you the snippet of where it was cited but not really give you any indication at all how it's been cited. Um, but of course, <laughs> just last night, um, I just took the screenshot this morning, Google has changed that. So you kind of see now by, this is if you click the house cited or the, the citing cases, um, there's these little bars that appear next to the cases. And these are kind of give you an indication of how much the case is discussed. Um, so there's discusses a cited case at length, discusses a cited case, and discuss, discusses a cited case briefly. Oh, that's hard to say. I used to have a list growing up and I went to speech therapy, but it, <laughs> those strings of words just almost brought it back out of me. 
Um, but these are very similar. Westlaw in their Keysight product has a star system that lets you know how often a case has been cited. Um, and so this is kind of functions that same way. It's still, they're not offering any um, indication of negative citing or, or negative treatment or positive treatment. That was all done by human editors from what I could tell at West. So probably that's why Google's not doing that. But maybe one day they will invent some sort of magic <laughs> that they can provide a little bit more indication of how the case is cited. Okay, so that is Google case law. And that is really where I would recommend doing a lot of your case law research. So um, now to kind of transition a little bit, let's talk about the legal web. If you really want, besides Google, other legal websites. And it's kind of, a, it's a mess right now. Someone should really create a digital public law library, I think. But, you know, until that time, you're going to have to kind of hunt and peck and see what's out there. Um, it's a mixture of government, commercial, and nonprofits. The government sites, you know, once again, as we say in the South, bless their hearts. They try and, um, but they're not always the most user friendly. And um, like, especially with case law, it will be, you know, sometimes you'll get a Word document, sometimes it'll be HTML, sometimes it'll be um, a PDF. They're not always easily searchable. Some states, Illinois is one of them, they, they take away all their old statutes every year and they'd only put it up the current, <laughs> what's currently passed by the legislature. It's, it's a mess. Um, but you know you're on a government website, A, it'll probably be really kind of ugly. Um, and it'll end in .gov, or if you're on a state level, be it could also it could be .gov, but it also could be state.il.us. And one thing to also, and this you'll notice this in your homework, um, it not necessarily won't be the official. I mean, it's published by the state. It should be public domain, but um, they, a lot, they get real nervous. I don't know if some sort of, <laughs> you know, Lawyers have, they have advising them, but the, you know, they'll put, you know, don't use this really for anything that you <laughs> would need law for. So um, we don't, we don't, you know, say that's accurate. It's not the official version, but so just be aware you're going to see that. And sometimes they'll try and throw copyright notices on it, which they can't, they shouldn't do. I mean, law is public. It's owned by the you know, people, but they try to copyright it sometimes. So just be aware of that. Wyoming, last time I checked, had this really huge copyright notice as soon as you entered their statutes page. It's, it was ridiculous. Um, on the commercial side, you'll have what's called freemium. So um, you know, they'll give you the primary law for free, but if you want to do a citator check, you have to pay for it. If you want to find related secondary resources, you have to pay for those. Um, or they're just sponsored by advertising. Or it can be contract work. Um, and this is just, you especially see this on the municipal level. It is just too much for a government sometimes, especially a little town government, to maintain their county codes or municipal codes online. And so they hire, you know, Unicode is one company that has a lot of these, excuse me, contracts. And they just hire them to do their, put their local laws online for them and to maintain the indexing for them. Um, but even states do it. Last time I checked, Tennessee state code was operated by Lexis. If you didn't know about it, you think you were on Lexis's website, but really that is Tennessee's official web page of their code. And then there's a lot of nonprofits and more. So um, Legal Information Institute is one of them. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things, it's done as a public service. There are a lot of people out there that believe law should be free and they try to work towards that. Um, there's also the reputation economy. It makes it makes them look good. You know, <laughs> a lot of times in the free um, law area, it's just it's public service, and they get paid by looking good. Um, so the rest of the slides that was pretty much the how to the quick quick and dirty intro to uh, legal research on the internet. Um, but the rest of these slides are just some um, uh, the the vetted sites that I kind of give the librarian thumbs up to. Feel free to check them out on how to do research. Um, secondary sources, LLRX has a law, law librarians research exchange, and that has a lot of topical research guides. So um, that and Zimmerman's both. Zimmerman, I think his name's Andy Zimmerman. He's a law librarian. Um, and he, he wrote his research guide. Lexis just happens to host it for him. And they have you know, their advertisements and stuff, but it's written by a law librarian. So it's like, if you're not sure about a topic, both LLRX and Zimmerman's will point you to the major resources in it. And again, those are both available for free on the web. There's some dictionaries, encyclopedias, um, the legal abbreviations. There's a book called Bieber's, like Justin Bieber, spelled the exact same way, um, but the book came first. It, if you like are pre presented with a abbreviation, in a, you know, some, especially like old British cases, 
that, you know, you don't see those every day. You have no idea what they are. Um, so you can go to Beavers or you could check out this website, plug it in, and they'll tell you that, you know, whatever this random assortment of letters is, is actually this reporter. Um, case law, Google Scholar, Good Justia, Fine Law, Fine Law and Lexis, Fine Law operated by West, Lexis operated by Lexis. Um, those are for more all federal and state. The U.S. Supreme Court website, shockingly hard to navigate through, but that it does have the court opinions there. If I had to find a Supreme Court case, I would go to the Supreme, LI Supreme Court, also Public Library of Law, um, Statutes, Codes, and Legislation, um, Statutes, Remember Law as Passed by the Legislature, Code, it's when they're all chopped up and organized by subject, and Legislation as Laws are being currently passed. Um, several sources there. The FD SIS, that's relatively new. That's the new government, that's the official government portal. It takes some practice to navigate that, but it will have um, the official government sources for all that stuff. And then admin law, which always gets kind of short shift, because um, it, it's what so much of, controls so much of what <laughs> governs you every day. Um, but LII, FD SIS, and public library law are the three biggies to get to that. And then for international, um, one I definitely want to point out is easel. International law, that's a law that governs relationships between countries, so like the UN, that's international law. Um, EASL is operated by ASL, which is the American Society of International Law. Um, that's a really great resource. GLIN is operated by the Library of Congress. That's foreign law, so that's like the law of Germany or the law of France. Um, when it's in their home language, so that can be kind of a problem if you don't speak German or French, but that's a good... Um, resource for foreign law, as are the world LAIs. LAI started here in the United States 20 years ago, but now they've kind of spread across the world. Um, world LAI is the portal to get to like the Australian Lee or the um, Canadian Lee, that sort of stuff. And then Global X is kind of research guides for foreign country specific information. Okay, I'm ready for questions if there are any. That was awesome, Sarah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So the 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 number one advice um, that, that I take away from that was uh, make friends with a law librarian. Yes, um, <laughs> that they, it that, really that, is. That, I mean, it you know we're, we're we look kind of scary and we can kind of we're probably just really shy, but we really do want to help you. That's why people you didn't become a law librarian for the money. Let me tell you that <laughs> you're doing it because but, you but, like to do research and you like to help people. Um, that's what they're there for. They. You know, we're librarians know a scary amount of stuff on how to do things, and we can save you a lot of time when you use us. So, feel free. So make so make sure there's a law librarian or two in your social network. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Lots of interesting questions. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pluck one from the middle there, and it's a one word question. Tidle Day. Um, is is that how you pronounce Tilda? <laughs> um. Did I? I don't know. I'm from the South. <laughs> from Appalachia, I mispronounce words all the time. <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong because it's one of those words that I read all the time, but I don't necessarily say. So, um, um, I, I think it might be a tilde. Did I? How did I pronounce it? Did I say tilde? I don't know. You said it's tilde. It's a line. <laughs> no, I actually like tilde day better. I think that's a better way to pronounce it. It's it sounds kind of hipster, so we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. Um. This is my, I'll, I'll admit, the, the top question there is, um, uh, can you see my screen, by the way? I can, yes. Okay, good. I'm, I want to make sure I, I did that. Um, is it malpractice, legal malpractice, to do poor legal research? It is. It, it really is to, if you don't use a citator. That is actually official hand to God malpractice. Um, but yeah, you, you are responsible for researching. It's, part, it's a legal skill. It's one of those things you have to do well. And that's why I feel so bad because, again, you know, students, they're thrown into legal research at such the worst time in their life. I mean, <laughs> and so you, you, a lot of people kind of get hooked with the idea that they're bad at research. You're not bad at research. You just haven't done it enough. Um, but, yes, save your malpractice for something more exciting like embezzling your client's money and going to Vegas on it. Don't get busted <laughs> for malpractice for doing bad research. Gotcha. So uh, why, why isn't there a free uh, legal research resource that's on par with uh, Lexis or Westlaw? Well, because a little over 100 years ago, John West developed this really great system for organizing the law and printing it. And he, he's had a big jump start on us. And 
it's a couple of reasons. One, it's hard to get people to trust free resources. You know, they always, you know, it's, you know, internet research is still you, you scary to a lot of people. For. Please? You get what you pay for. Yeah. Right? There, there is that idea that if someone's giving it away for free, it's not worth anything. Um, the governments have not, you know, even, you know, like a state like Tennessee, which, you know, I mean, obviously in this time of day and time, all states or budgets are having problems, but they find it easier to just shift it off to, to just contract it out to the commercial publisher. So the government hasn't stepped up to really create these laws because actually until the internet, until computers became more ubiquitous, you know, it, it was a huge operation for West to go through and get all, you know, they get all the cases sent in, you know, you know, they're one of the first to have like things, you know, teletyped in like the cases every day from all the courts, Lexus and Westlaw both. And then they organized it and they had applied a key number to it and they sent it, you know, and they organized that way. It took a lot of money and a lot of manpower. And then they printed all these books. Um, and it's really just a matter of time right now for the rest of the world to catch up. But it's going to need a lot of government help to, pr to provide the raw materials that anyone can create a free resource. Um, and it's going to take the legal community stop you know, relying upon less than Lex less than Lex Lexus and Westlaw. I mean, the fact that two thirds of the states still require a dependency on just a site case law, you know, you have to still use these just a site things. It's a, it's a long row road ahead. Yeah. It's expensive, complicated, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's difficult entry into that market space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's a question. Is the Wayback Machine or archive.org recently lost funding that you know of? Not that I know um, of. It, yeah, if that's yeah. entirely, I kind of been on a news blackout. <laughs> so I mean, not that I know of, but if it is, that is a darn shame because it's a really valuable resource. I haven't either, and I and from all my um, uh, news feeds, um, Brewster's still doing an awesome job with uh, Internet Archive. In fact, um, expanding, they're they're scanning uh, orphaned works and turning them into uh, sellable books um, at a, at a huge clip. Um, he seems to be trying to do the the, the Google Book Project without the litigation, um, <laughs> and and so um, I don't I don't I have not heard anything along that. What are your thoughts on using Zotero uh, as a Firefox add-on? Have you ever used Zotero? I have not, but I know a lot of people. I know the person that literally wrote the book on Zotero. Um, I from what I I, I kind of got out of the legal you doing scholarly research right when Zotero became very very popular. I've only heard good things about it. It does get, there's, um, I know an add-on being currently developed. I don't think, I don't know if it has been made live yet to get stuff in blue booking format. That's the one problem with your legal materials. We're always kind of like the redheaded stepchild of all research. <laughs> to get stuff in blue booking format through Zotero was not easy. But otherwise, it's just, a, it's a really good free um, clipping service. Excellent. Does Google track your, uh, track your research in Google Scholar? It and does, other. and you know what? It that could end up being if you are a practicing attorney, I could see where things might start to get a little hairy that way. If, you know, um, I try. You know, I'm also kind of paranoid and weird. Like when I'm doing a lot of research, I try to log out. Because um, one thing you have to understand: if you're using anything for free on the internet, you know, Facebook, Google, that sort of thing. Google is not a search company. Google is a company that sells search habits of people to advertisers. That's how yep. Google makes money. Same thing with Facebook, you know. So I try, you know, it is all right. I have different Google accounts, and I kind of, you know, it, it freaks me out sometimes when I do think about that. And there's any of these searches there, they know. It looks That's like it's almost a go ahead. I just saw the comment out there. What are you going to say? That, that's almost uh, <laughs> it's a truism. If you're on the internet, you're being tracked. Um, and it's, it's, it's almost its own, um, uh, not even just like a single class, but an entire course of, of how, to, how to hide from the internet. Um, and so, you know, it's probably safer to assume that whatever you're doing can be, um, um, is, is being seen at some level by somebody somewhere. Yeah. There is no privacy, get over it. Um, <laughs> um, Google Scholar, is it good for non-attorneys or others who aren't uh, trained in the law? Um, I, I would say I, be careful there. <laughs> yeah, I would say be careful. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things like after you've done a lot of secondary research and kind of have an idea of what the full scope of that area of law is and what the, you know, sticking points are. Um, but it's, I mean, for academic reasons, if you're doing it for academic purposes, 
you know, and, and we're talking Google Scholar, there's, you know, the two levels, there's the case law, the primary law research, the case law research, and then there's the secondary, like the law journal articles. For law journal articles, it's great. And other scholarly articles, it's actually really fabulous because um, it just kind of skips its step of having to log into a library database in many ways. Um, but anytime you're doing, you're not a trained attorney doing legal research, you have to be kind of careful because the stakes are so high, you know, stare decisis, race judicata, once something's done, you can't, there's no do-overs a lot of times in law. So you have to be super careful if you're actually, you know, going into something that's for keeps. Um, but I mean, it's, it's a good training. It's, it's good for, cause it's free. You're, so you're not racking up bills to Lexis and Westlaw. If it's something you're, you know, you just, you know, your attorney's talking about something and you want to figure out what the heck they're talking about. Yeah. Then it's, and then it's good. But, you know, I would I would vote for the secondary resources. Law libraries all over the country open to the public. I'm either you know the county courthouse ones are being shut down because of budgets, but academic law libraries, you know, especially if they're government docs, they have to let you in. Um, but be aware that those are, those options are out there for you. Very good. Um, time for one last question. Let, let's throw you a zinger. So, what are the differences between uh, Lexis and Westlaw in research? <laughs> 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 um i actually i was more of a lexus person um and it, and it's really it's so funny it's just whichever one you use more and i just i happen to like lexus more there's really not too many differences the one weird one is that westlaw will interpret any space between words as an or and so that will really mess you up um westlaw has a wider uh breadth of secondary materials that pop up more uh -huh. i mean but let's face it i mean and lexus's search is not quite as good and they they just rolled out a new product that I never it was like right as I left libraries they rolled it out so I never really got to play with it too much but I've heard a lot of complaints about it um but really it's like choosing between Burger King and McDonald's for a lot of times <laughs> it's kind of a personal preference thing whatever you have access to but good, good analogy all right great thanks Sarah really appreciate that um we'll be posting the uh, links that you uh that you had in your um uh, presentation uh, to the website as well as these questions and we'll be bugging you for, uh, for, for answers if we didn't get to any of them. Um, let's get to the uh, homework. We got a couple of minutes before the uh, hour is up. So the homework assignment is this one, a homework assignment number five. Um, we're, 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 we're making things easy for you folks. This is, this is an easy homework assignment. We want you to find the web page uh, for the government website that is the primary legal source in your state or jurisdiction for the cases, codes, statutes, uh, or regulate and regulations, list them in your homework wiki. And um, we want you to create a single page, which is to say we want you, the collective class, to create a single page where all the state links for these things can be found. If you're, since there are more of you than there are states, if your state has already been linked, then, you know, then grab another state and contribute in that way. Um, and I will uh, show you that link in a, in a second. No, I'll just go right there. Um, and so I've already created sort of a, a blank page there with all the states for you to uh, go in and uh, collectively and collaboratively uh, fill in. Now, uh, here, here's the special offer for that. If, you, if the class completes this assignment, which is to say all 50 states get links, then, uh, then I will give a special bonus badge to everyone for collaborative, uh, collaborative coordination, collective collaboration, something along those lines um, on your homework wiki page. Don't forget to put a little dash five dash next to your name on the homepage. That's how I know when you've finished the homework. It saves me time instead of having to link through, click through you, your links um, to take a look and see if anything uh, got done. I would be remiss if I didn't say that uh, because uh, I am the executive director of Cali, and if you go to a Cali member law school, there are over 130 legal research related lessons on the Cali website. Um, an awful lot of them about primary legal research um, in, in, in dozens of states as well as secondary uh, legal research. Um, we, we still have some states that we are working with law librarians around the country to work on. So if you're at a Cali member law school, which is almost all law schools, you can go to the Cali law, uh, website and run those lessons and, and learn some more. All right. Um, I think we're, 
think we're done for the day. Let me make sure by going to my slideshow because that's how I follow it. Yes, that's my last slide. Thank you very much. That was week five of Topics in Digital Law Practice. Hope to see you all next week. Uh, have a great week. The organizer has ended the session and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.